Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another live stream on the History Valley podcast. And today I'm joined by David McDonald. He has a YouTube channel called The Deep uh, the Deep Drinks. I have a link to uh, his YouTube channel in the description below. So please head over there and hit subscribe. And that being said, welcome to History Valley podcast, David McDonald. Thank you so much for having me on, Jacob. Uh, I've, I've seen you around for a long time and I just keep seeing you. And I think I've reached out and I was like, man, I just see you everywhere. Are you talk to all my <laughs> friends? Like, I, like I, I'm, I'm sure I'm talking to all your friends. Like we should connect. So yeah. How you doing? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's great to have you here. Um, can you tell us, um, I'd like to start us off with, can you tell us a little bit about your journey about leaving Christianity? Cause you were once a Christian eventually, eventually, uh, you lost your faith. Can you tell us a bit about what led you into leaving Christianity? Well, yeah, of, of course. Is there, um, it's quite a complex uh, subject. There's a lot of different, I guess, approaches I can take. Is, is your audience mainly non-Christians or are they ex-Christians? Or uh, I, would you say, some... I would say mostly non-Christian, but there are, mm -hmm. there are some. Uh, I think there are some believers that do watch the show, but yeah, I've, I, from based on what I see in the comments, it seems to me that most of the audience is atheist. Or okay, not. okay, that just helps me because uh, the, it, c beliefs are a very complex, um, complex thing, and there are a million moving parts in, I guess, my psyche, at least for me, with my belief. And so, I guess it, it just affects how I will tell the story. But for me, there was definitely two parts. In, I guess in my brain that kind of shifted. There was the emotional part where I was really affected emotionally about some things. And then that, that gave me the impetus to look into the logical side of things for my beliefs. And, uh, but to, to go back to the beginning uh, is I grew up a Christian. Uh, my mother and father brought me up to be Christian. We, I, I used to read the, you know, the kids Bible. I always wanted to, um, to uh, hear the story of King David because he had my same name, a bit of an egomaniac apparently. And, uh, and yeah, I grew up as a Christian in my um, early teenage years. I got involved in a church. I then moved up with my father uh, when my parent, my parents just split early as a child. I moved up with my father. I kind of walked away from God at that time. I still believed in God, but I was living in the world as you could say. And, uh, and then one night I was invited to a youth group. And I went along to this youth group and it was a Pentecostal style youth group. And I had um, a life altering transformational quote unquote spiritual experience. And from that moment on, I was a diehard um, believer. Uh, a few weeks later, I went to youth camp. I saw a lot of quote unquote spiritual things happen there. And I remember thinking to myself, I can never deny the things that I'm seeing here. I can never deny seeing people speak in tongues. I can never deny speaking in tongues. I can never deny seeing my friends roll around on the floor, having compulsions uh, or visions or passing out. I can never deny any of those things. Uh, and I still don't deny them, by the way. I just don't necessarily hold to the same conclusions of, of what those things are. Uh, and yeah, so I was a Christian and I um, became a youth pastor only three or four years after that. I took over a youth ministry of like, I don't know, like 80 to 100 kids. Uh, and I was only 19 at the time. And after a series of um, kind of snaky, suspicious, um, I'm trying to use my words carefully here, events by some of the people that were my managers at the church, uh, I be, uh, lost the job as a youth pastor with only, only in like a year's time, a year or six months or a year of being youth pastor. And that process of really believing that I was a um, destined by God to be in that role, that I felt God had given me visions, that I felt that I told my leaders that I could see, I could clearly remember seeing green pastures ahead of us, metaphorically, and that I just I knew exactly where God want, God wanted us to be, and uh, and then and then kind of having to leave them, I guess, in the mud uh, because I didn't get a chance to fulfill that part was um was quite emotionally difficult and so it was it was i guess that that really kicked off my well not kicked off but started me on a journey of of trying to i guess heal those emotional parts of myself and make make sense of the whole you know system like did what did god really want me in that role this is something i did in that role and and everything everything like that 
shortly after that, I um, started developing um, anxiety, really bad panic attacks. I would um, throw up from panic attacks. I was having a really hard time. And I remember going to many different people at church. I'd go to, uh, I went, I think this was what my week looked like. I think on Monday nights, I went to some sort of, I went to counseling on Tuesday, I went to the Tuesday night prayer meeting. So it was church counseling Monday, Tuesday night prayer meetings on, on a Tuesday. Wednesday, I would catch up with either the worship pastor or someone else that used to be one of my colleagues. Um, Thursday, I would have um, another therapy session with a male um, pastor to talk about male things and then a male counselor. And then Friday, nothing. Saturday, I'm not sure I might catch up with someone and then Sunday church. So it was like, I was just cramming in like almost every day. And um, that might be a little bit off, but I remember going through it a, a little while ago and nothing was working. And then my dad and my stepmom really convinced me. They're like, please go see a psychologist, like someone who's accredited. And I did. And, uh, and I went to this psychologist and they kind of, and I've gone, I've gone, I've told this part of the story a couple of times, but they did some things in that, in that office that kind of showed me that what I was dealing with was intrusive thoughts and, uh, I guess OCD. So I was kind of diagnosed with like, what he said was like, I said, Are you, you keep saying OCD. Do you think I've got OCD? And he said, you're getting pretty close <laughs> is what he first said to me. But, uh, essentially, yeah, I had I, I was diagnosed with a form of OCD and it just so happened that the thing that I was, the intrusive thought that I was having was what I called the voice of God. So like it was, it was God telling me to break up with my partner at the time, Amy, who's now my wife, good luck kid. And God told me to break up with, I felt God told me to break up with Amy and the psychologist, um, uh, uh, like, I guess, demonstrated to me in this office that that was an intrusive thought. And then I realized, uh oh, maybe this voice of God that I've heard so clearly before in my in my in the past was an OCD tick. Maybe it was something purely psychological. And um, yeah, so that's I guess the emotional side of things. And then from there, I guess I moved into wanting to investigate my beliefs and like I truly understand like well if I can be so fooled if I can be so tricked I need to I need to, I need to know which way is up I don't even know which like I was so discombobulated I was so just all over the place I didn't know how to like grab onto reality and then yeah that's when I started to truly look into things and after you left the faith did you have friends or did you, did you lose friends did any family members that you have, did, did any of them have a hard time with you leaving the religion? Um, well, yes, it will definitely. Um, but I think that, I think that, I think that in the process of leaving, because for me, it wasn't like a decision I made all of a sudden. It was, like I said, I, I started investigating things logically. I think it started with the Bill Nine Ken Ham debate. I watched that and I was like, and and it's actually funny. At the, at the time, I thought they both made really great points. And now I look, watch, watch, watch it back. And I'm like, what point did Ken Ham even make? Like, this is so bizarre. Like, he, he just, his point was essentially Christians, scientists can be Christians too. And like, I'm like, well, like, it was so bizarre. But right at the end of that debate, it's become a staple on deep drinks to ask this question. And that is, what if anything would change your mind? And Bill Nye's answer to that question was evidence, any type of evidence at all. And Ken Ham's um, answer to that question was nothing. He starts from the presupposition that the Bible is true. And I remember thinking, ooh, that's not right. And I developed this process of like, okay, I need to, I need to remove that bias from my mind if I'm going to analyze these belief systems. Because I can't go into like, is God real? Of course he is. I'm going to go find the evidence for it. I needed to to go into it like, okay, let's pretend I don't know that God's real. Let's and pretend too, because I still believe in God. Let's pretend that I don't know God's real. Let's pretend that I don't know um, that the Bible is true. Let's pretend that I don't like. Let's, let's try and remove as much bias as possible. Let's uh, when I read the 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 verses about women, don't look at it as a man. You know, look at it just just look at it from is this fair? Is this fair or not? You know things like that. And I tried really hard. And when I did that, I started noticing huge, like, well, 
I started noticing tiny little cracks and I'm like, that's interesting. I'm still a Christian, but that's interesting. I'm going to keep investigating that crack. And then that crack would grow the next time I looked at it and it would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the more and more I looked into it, the less answers there were and the bigger the problem became. And it was at that moment that I, I would say that my friends and family started having issues. My family were mostly good, to be honest, but a lot of my, um, my extended family weren't so much, but, and, and I guess this was the most hard, like the hardest thing for me as well is I was like still a Christian and I'm like, Hey, I've got this, I've got this, this major problem that I've found and I, I need to talk to someone about it. And I would bring these problems to my friends, honestly, like my friends, my colleagues, my pastors, worship leaders, and I would, I got this problem and not only could they not answer them or if they did answer them, they answered them like they didn't understand the problem, but they were so dishonest, like unbelievable, like to, to like, I'm talking about flat out lying, like just like, just really dishonest about, about it. And I was like, this is so bizarre. Cause like, I, th I thought we were in the, in the business of truth. I thought we were in the business of following the, like, following Jesus because he is true, not because we want to or we it makes our lives more convenient, but because it's the truth. And um yeah, so I had a lot of um a lot of run-ins with friends and families about that. And I lost um I'm trying to think of specifics. I had I had many friends on un unfollow me on Facebook. Um and this wasn't for posting edgelord atheist memes that that came later, but but before I started posting edgelord atheist memes, just just for being just for asking questions, I guess a um, a big a really big thing was in Australia there was the same sex marriage plebiscite, which was where you guys vote. Did you guys vote on same sex marriage over in the US, or was it just something that got passed through? I think it was, I think it was passed through. I'd have to go. Um, I mean, yeah, it was definitely legalized, uh, but mm. I don't remember all the circumstances of it on the top of my head right now. So, yeah, okay. So in Australia, we had a, a plebiscite and essentially the government just mailed out a letter to everyone and everyone had to fill it in and drop it back. And, and it, the question was, do you think, like, it was something along the lines of, like, should members of the LGBT community be able to get married? Like, a man and a man and a woman and a woman. And... Um, at the time, I had friends who I went through ministry college with. Actually, the first person I interviewed on Deep Drinks, episode number one, was my friend Colin, who was closeted for 45 years. And he, he's always been gay and he's never had, a, never had a relationship. And he was suicidal. And so were other friends of mine who were suicidal, who were Christians, who were suicidal because of how hard it was for them to justify their beliefs with their... Uh, their their essence, their identity, who they were attracted to, who they loved, and so I started engaging online because I thought it was important because I literally had depressed, suicidal, very hurting friends, and trying to get to the bottom of this this issue of you know same sex relations or same sex you know biblical not not even biblically but like like just you know is it good for society is it bad for society. And I, I actually, could, could, I write, could I read out something that I, I, I wrote? Sure. So I pulled this up because this is a big part of my story, but I actually, it, apparently it was six years ago. And I remember I was sitting in a cafe and I posted on Reddit. And um, I think it's the, the most popular Reddit thread I've ever posted, which isn't much. But essentially, it's, it, the thread was called, am I... <clears throat> Am I an atheist now? All my religious friends hate me. And what I said was, and so I, was, I still kind of thought I was a Christian at the time, but I said, I'll start off by saying that I don't know what I am. I was brought up as Christian. I strayed away from God as a teen. And as a later teen, I had a radical emotional moment in a youth group. Years later, I became non a non-ordained youth pastor in a Pentecostal church overseeing 100 youth on a Friday night. I lay my hands on people as they fell over. I spoke in tongues and I generally felt, generally felt like I had a connection with what I called God at the time. But what am I now? I'll skip over the long journey of how I got to where I am today. But to summarize, I started to investigate what I believed and why. 
not because I was doubting, but because I was gen generally interested in what I believed and why so that I could engage with others and help them understand where I was coming from. When I let go of my presuppositions, especially religious ones, in examining my beliefs, my world opened up. I examined my beliefs and found glaring and obvious flaws in my thinking. I quickly tried to rectify this by digging deeper and deeper and looking at the evidence as honestly as I could. But the more I looked and the more I realized how wide the gap in some of my core beliefs were. When I would politely ask my Christian friends or pastors about these problems, I not only didn't get a satisfactory reason to answer, but many of them would ignore, my, ignore me or distance themselves. I recently had a polite um, Facebook discussion on same-sex marriage as it was being voted on in Australia. I literally asked nice questions about how it would objectively change our society. I specifically asked to stay away from people's personal subjective religious beliefs and explained why, as I was trying to keep it objective and not offend anyone's beliefs. But instead, all my Christian friends kept bringing it back to that, sometimes aggressively so. After I decided to engage with their questions, I literally went through and counted how many separate people started the conversation, and then when I asked compelling questions, they would either stop replying or delete all of their comments or unfriend me. And it was 24 people, 24 literal people, like separately, not separate threads, 24 separate people. I would then tag them, I would message them privately, nothing, crickets. But then the next day, they would be on another thread spewing the exact same points that I that they agreed that I had like uh, demolished or shown not to be true. Like they agreed, they, okay, that doesn't make any sense, but then they would just be saying the same thing the next day. Um, I said, it actually hurt my feelings quite a lot as I couldn't understand how they could be so dishonest. Was my faith also so dishonest? I can't deny that I know that I have good, good reasons to believe in God, but I still have some very strong emotional feelings towards the experiences I had. It might be the case that I'm an atheist, but I just can't vocalize, vocalize it yet. I don't know. Um, and then I finished off by saying, so why am I writing this? Well, as I sit in a cafe by myself, thinking of all the friends that I've had that have distanced themselves from me, I can't help but feel saddened and angry. I have not pushed any of them away, I have, um, but I am like an untouchable. I am not out abusing children or burning churches to the ground. I'm just critically examining what I believe and why. If there is a God, how irrational to believe that he would want us to deny reality and believe whatever we like about him instead of following the evidence. Has anyone gone through this? Any advice? Um, and yeah, that that moment, like in that cafe, was was definitely like a, like a, oh, I don't know if I can swear, but, <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> this is uh this is just this is just too much like this is th this is becoming like too much to deal with and then from that moment on i was like well i guess around that time i was like i'm going to kind of pursue the evidence um and i talked to my wife about this and and um and kind of that's a whole other story but yeah so i'm sorry if that was a long-winded way of answering your question <laughs> oh no i don't mind at all um what about hell? When you left the religion, were you worried at all in the slightest about what if hell turned out to exist and I end up there um, for leaving the faith? Mm. Well, to be honest, I don't know how much hell had in, I had an issue with hell because I really like, how, how can I explain this? Like, when you look under the rug and you notice something, you can't like unnotice it. The only way to unnotice that thing or to is would be to pretend like I didn't see it, which would be lying, which I felt like was sinful. I felt like I had no choice. It wasn't like a choice to believe or not believe. So I, I felt like I, I would feel, I would feel bad if I, I guess mocked God or mocked the Bible uh, which would usually come when I was like talking to someone who was trying to defend slavery or, or, or something, I would, I would get emotional about it. But I, so I never really, I don't think I had a strong fear of hell, maybe a little bit. I think I, I we did a hell cast panel on one of my first channels where we kind of deconstructed hell and it was a, a, a bit of a problem, I'm pretty sure, but it's been so long now that I, I just have no, like <laughs> it's <laughs> the idea of hell is almost comforting, not like the biblical hell, but it's like, 
I think of it like, wow, that'd be like, it'd be like a video game, right? It'd be like, like, I'm just thinking like, like it's, it's interesting on the same level that like Greek myths are interesting. Like when I think of hell, I'm like, oh, whoa. Like, so I wonder what like the biblical hell will be like, but it's like, there's no fear in that for me anymore at all. But one thing that I do for some reason have fear about, which is, it, um, but I still don't really understand what it is, which is blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. Like I have no idea why I'm still paranoid about that even though I don't really know what it is, but I just remember always being paranoid. Like, what if I accidentally, when I was a Christian, what if I accidentally blaspheme the Holy Spirit and I'm like kicked out of the club for good and there's nothing I can do. Um, so that's one thing that I guess I've, I've been scared about, but yeah, hell I think for me was totally like, just, just like, it's, it's, it's a laughable, laughable concept to me now that people, uh, that I believe that. And, but it bothers me too that, that so many people get affected by it. Um, especially when I see like kids, kids getting taught about hell and stuff, like it really bothers me. Uh, and I know a lot of Christian, I'd know a lot of atheists who are still scared of hell, even though they can objectively think that it's not true. They still f get worried about it. But yeah, for me, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. I find it so interesting that the Holy spirit is the one thing you just can't cross. That's the red line. <laughs> And yeah. somehow you're supposed to imagine that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God, at least according to the interpretation of the Trinity, are somehow free and yet the same being. So how, yeah. do, you, how do you blaspheme? Because what I'm curious about is how, how does one work out? If you blaspheme God or Jesus, that's cool. But if the Holy Spirit, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, who is also supposed to be God, yeah that's not okay. yeah that it's so yeah i know and look look to be honest i i i was very much part of a church that we were signs and miracles and wonders and things like that and i never like thought too much about like i went to ministry college for a year and we we learned stuff there but it was never a huge issue for me but what i found is like things like the trinity are huge issues for a lot of Christians. Like there must be a Trinity and there must be like, you know, and like they get really like, you know, like I think even Michael Jones was like, if you don't accept the Trinity, like he was making a video on, um, and my, Michael's a friend of mine, but he was making a video on Mormons and he was like, they don't believe in the Trinity. Like that's a, that's a factor of like a Christian. And it's like, I didn't, what really? Like to me, when I was a Christian, that didn't make no difference. Like I don't care. And so, <laughs> so like, I'm actually in the process now of like, and what I love doing about on deep drinks and, and like having conversations with people like you is I'm learning about like these theological problems that I never even considered when I was a Christian. So like, I think I've got, um, uh, Captain Dadpool is coming on the channel soon. We've still got to organize a date and he's, we're just going to be looking at the Trinity because he's looked right into the Trinity. And I'm like, for one, I want to know what's the big deal. Like, why is everyone so like up in arms about the Trinity? And then also like, what is, where did the Trinity come from? Like, what's the, because it's, it's super fascinating to me because it's like watching, are you are you a bit of an are you a nerd at all? Do you play like Dungeons and Dragons or video games or anything like that? I have not played Dungeons. I have not played Dungeons and Dragons, but I play video games like Halo, Call of Duty, oh. Commander. Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, well, the, I guess I, I, well with Dungeons and Dragons, you you have like um you, like people are in a campaign and like things become like really important. So we we played a campaign where we we made friends with a giant crab. And we gave him a top hat and he could talk to us and we, we convinced him to come on our adventures with us. Um, and uh, and literally, like at the end of the campaign, he got a huge axe for the head and was like cut in half by this like, <laughs> like, right. And it was really emotional that this um, this crab died. Um, I forgot what his name, Stinky Winky or Winky. I forgot, forgot his name or anything. One of our guys in our campaign and like nearly cried. Like he was like distraught over this like fake crab dying. And that's what I think, I, that's how I feel about, sorry. And we also printed our little AI photo of um, the crab and gave it to him in a little frame, but um, which is so nerdy and weird. But what it's like looking at these like religious battles is essentially like people are in this D&D &D campaign and, <laughs> and I'm like, guys, can we just be serious for a moment? Like, you know, like there, there are like people of the LGBT community are getting affected, like women are being affected. Can we just like just like pump the brakes like and get out of the game for a little bit so we can like solve these like social issues and then we can go back to like having fun and pretending like 
any of this is actually like relevant in the real world. Like it's just, it, 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 it because it's to me, investigating these things has become entertaining, but for very different reasons. I'm not like trying to work out what the will of God is and like, you know, but I'm like, okay, slavery. Why is that in the Bible? If it's supposed to be the perfect, you know, unedited, perfect word of God, or like, why would God command slavery? That's, that's, that's bizarre, isn't it? Like, Hmm. Uh, and so it becomes interesting on that level for me. So in general, how did things feel like after your slow pro progress of leaving the faith and after you were totally clear of the religion and then after you went through losing friends and all the other stuff that you were mentioning earlier? Uh, did you feel... Well, go ahead. So what are you asking specifically? Like, how did it feel when I finally was like, I'm an atheist now and... Yes. Of a cuss. Yeah, so I don't... So it's again, it's very complicated. I wish I had just a moment where I'm like, I am an atheist and I'm like awesome and like everything's great. Uh, I still get affected by purity culture in my marriage. I still feel shame and guilt around sex sometimes, which is really bizarre, especially because my wife and I waited until we uh, were married to have sex um, properly for the first time. Uh, I still have uh, religious guilt around certain things, but every day it's like a step forward. What I will say is letting go of those religious shackles is, is like very enjoyable. But there was a moment uh, in my life where I, where, where the world was like an episode of like Rick and Morty or a sci-fi. I, 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 like I landed on an alien planet. Everything was very familiar. Like there's still gravity. There's still like the stuff's still, still going on. But I'm, but also I'm not sure what's, what is real and what isn't real. So it was like learning all over again. So it was like, we went to the zoo and um, we walked past the fossils and there's like in the store. And I was like, there's some, there's some fossils here. And I'm like looking at these like dinosaur fossils. And I'm like, I, for $60, I can buy, well, it was like $30. I can buy a 60 million year old fossil of a dinosaur tooth. And I'm like, what? And I bought it. And I was like, this is real. Like, this isn't just like the scientists lying to us to hide the flat earth or something. This is like real. This is like a, this is 65 million years old and like just learn like being absolutely blown away by the fact that there's like a fossil and I'm like, I can just buy it for $35. And everyone's like, that's not real. Like it's real. It's real. Like it's real. Like, and I was like, it, it, it was, it was honestly really, really, um, really, really weird or, uh, things like, um, what else can, what else was that? There was that just felt so alien, but so, uh, when we, when Amy and I decided to have a kid, um, our son Atlas, before we, we had him, we were going through the process of IVF and I was like, shit. I was like, what are we? Sorry. I, I don't know if I, sorry. I yeah, shouldn't have thought. That's okay. That's okay. Okay. Um, Australian was part of my <laughs> vocabulary, but um, I was like, what do we teach this kid about stuff? Like, is it okay to steal? I don't know. Like it's not, you know, I was told it's not okay to steal because it's one of the 10 commandments. Probably not, probably not a good thing to steal, but I all of a sudden have to investigate that. Like, is it a good thing to steal? Is it a good thing to curse? Is it a good thing to honor your mother and father? Like I had to, I, I no longer had these presuppositions that I could just fall back on and I had to examine everything. Um, it's, it became really interesting. And it's like everything in our lives became like something to investigate. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was very scary. It was very exciting. It was very interesting. It was very alien. It was very familiar. It was just, and, and that process came on really strong. Um, and then has like kind of stayed with me, but like slowed down a little bit as I slowly shed religious baggage. And there, I don't mean to like, there, religion does a lot of great things. And I got a lot of good things from my religious upbringing and a lot of good things from the stuff I learned at church and some of the religious rituals and stuff are, can be really good. I just don't think they're true. So I just don't want to make, make it look like I'm painting religion to be just horrible. Um, but what I will say is um, that that moment of when I kind of felt free to explore this alien world was actually, it's a bit of a funny story. Amy, I sat down with Amy my wife and I said, look, I don't want you to come with me on this journey. I just want to be able to tell you where I'm at when I'm looking at things and investigating things. Remember, we're both Christians at the time. Like, I'm just, I just want to investigate things. So maybe I learn something new that pivots my idea of God, or maybe 
you know, what, maybe I don't believe in heaven anymore, but like, I just, can I, I asked her, can I please come and talk to you about that? And she's like, yeah, sure. Like, I'd love to hear about what you're learning and doesn't mean I have to change. I'm like, no, I don't want you to, you could be a Buddhist. You could be a Christian. You could do whatever you want. I don't care. And uh, she bought me tickets to go to this um, science festival in, in Brisbane, which is an hour down the road from where we, uh, it's a city an hour away from us. And, and uh, it was a science and faith panel. And they had like, I've told this story a bunch of times, but they had like a, I think it was like a Buddhist, a Christian, a Catholic, a Muslim, a Protestant, like they had all different religions on, on stage, all scientists and every one of them, and we were sitting in the crowd and every one of them was saying, there is nothing wrong with my faith and um, my scientific beliefs. Um, they don't, they, they, they fit perfectly like a glove. Like it's all good. I just, you know, I just, I just, you know, when I go into the lab, I, you know, I look at the wonders of God and they were saying all kind of stuff like this. Right. And there was one other person on that panel and it was an atheist and it was AC Grayling and AC Grayling was there. And I didn't know who this person was, but he kind of looked like Doc Brown to me at the time. And I'm, I'm looking at AC Grayling and he says, well, um, it gets to him at the end of the panel and he goes, well, I, I, I now realize that I've only been brought here to disagree with everyone because I disagree. And he said that science starts with the perspective that we're they, they try to disprove the hypothesis where faith tries to protect the idea the belief that's the already found belief where science does the opposite it's like how can we disprove this one thing so we can arrive closer to truth and uh he's the only one i agreed with on that panel and afterwards um we were walking out and he was the only one popular enough to have a book sign signing amy uh, went to the bathroom and i went up to his book <laughs> books and i saw this one book called the god belief uh, or the God problem. And it's a book on secular humanism. I didn't actually finish it, but I thought it was a book about God or something. And I picked it up. I thought it was like a Richard Dawkins, you know, God delusion type book. I picked it up and I was like shaking. And I was like, it felt like some profound form of blasphemy to like purchase his book or to go and even get it signed. So like Amy comes back from the bathroom and I'm like going over in the line. And I said to him like, Oh, I said, um, and I tried to justify myself to him as if like, like I'm trying to like justify, I'm like, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm, I'm investigating what I believe and why. And, and, and then he just stopped the, um, the signing and said, he looked up to me and said, how are you doing? And I said, uh, well, you know, it's, it's hard, but you know, and, and he goes, how, how are you really doing emotionally? And he sat and talked to me for a little while. And then we got like this photo together, but, and, and, and then I said to him, um, well, I was a bit taken aback by like how nice he was. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll let you know how I, how I feel about your book. I'll send you an email. And he said, okay. And then he wrote his email on the back of the book. And it was like something at like Yahoo or, or something like it was an old email. Like, and I was like, wow, he's giving me his like proper email. And I, I walked out of there and I felt so like, it was such a weird feeling. And then my wife, Amy, she said the words to me, I, I think what you're doing is good. And investigating in our, in, in, in investigating what we believe and why I think what you're doing is good. And I was like, whoa. And then it was at that moment that I realized that she understood the internal conflict that I was having about wanting to know what was true, but having that conflict with my personal upbringing and my beliefs. And then she was kind of giving me permission to just, to just, she was like saying, it's good. Like, I'm glad, I'm proud of you for doing this. And she, I think she's even said she's proud of me. And we talked for a while and I was like, whoa. And from that moment on, I was like, okay. I got my wife's blessing. I'm just going to, I'm going to jump into this and I'm just going to like truly try and follow the evidence where it leads. I'm not going to try and be an atheist or a Christian. I'm just going to look at the evidence. And that's, that was the moment that I was like, what, you know, like what I remember, yeah, not to, not to keep rambling on, but I remember like thinking about like, cause I was a young earth creationist and I was like, okay, so kangaroos hopping all the way to Australia and and I was like, what about koalas? Like koalas, like they will eat, they will choose to starve and die. They're so dumb. They got, they've actually got smooth brains. Their brains are actually smooth. That all their energy through evolution went to essentially, um, and they sleep for like eighteen hours a day or something. But they went, it went to just eating eucalyptus leaves that are poisonous to everything else, and just and just surviving on them and just munching and munching, and they will literally choose to die in a tree if they can't get the leaves that they want. And they'll have leaves that they want at a certain height of the tree. They'll have different species of eucalyptus. They'll have different like ages of the leaves. 
and you can't even take a koala and move it like a few hundred kilometers away or you know 100 miles away because it won't it will just sometimes it will just die in the tree and i'm thinking how do these koalas like pop up after noah's ark waddle all the way to australia without any food source for years as these as these um eucalyptus trees grow back how did the seeds get there in the first place these waterlogged seeds or whatever and they wait for these like i'm like it just can't it can't work and and uh yeah so things like that was just <laughs> very interesting I'm like okay so if that doesn't work then what does work like and the, yeah anyway so sorry i'm rambling a lot <laughs> oh no that, that was great um so that's so basically you're explaining the process of you abandoning young, young earth creationism as you're understanding that koalas for instance that you were just mentioning um because koalas make no sense with the whole yeah. Noah, sto Noah story mm -hmm. um what would you say was the perhaps what you would consider the final straw that caused you to abandon the whole the whole idea of young earth creationism of young earth creationism um i think i think aaron ra's series on noah's flood really caused me some like issue like that was like oof, like this is this is hard his episode on paleontology just made so much sense about how you know we discover these fossils and we're like oh there were things that exist before humans existed and and then looking into that i think i think it was around the time his noah's ark series came out that i really was like this is just this is just silly and mind you though uh i try still to be as open-minded uh as possible if someone came to me and they're like i really want to convince you of like noah's magical zoo boat that it would be hard very hard but i could try as hard as i possibly could to try and remove the biases i have and just go okay what what are you showing what evidence are you showing me and then try and look at it without a bias and then go okay let's let's test it as true and test it's true okay if it is true okay what does that mean like i i can actually do that um and i have done that with you know muslims and christians about their, their about their claims but but yeah like at that I think it was it was Aaron Ra's series and the study that I did after that um, that really convinced me that I mean and also I think the only way you can be a young earth creationist is if you just engage in like blatant conspiracy theories where like the whole world is is like trying to deceive us it's like it's at, it's at the level of flat earth it's like they're trying to hide something it's like okay like I have scientists, family members, and like, are they like, I don't know, are they part of the, this group of like deceivers? Like, I don't know, like, I don't know. So, yeah, it's interesting because that's true. Because especially when you break it down and you look at the fact that they each have different ways of attempting to prove these stories in the Bible or in the Quran, different apologists saying different things. They come up with different ideas to try to prove their faith. And sometimes their attempts contradict what another person does to try to prove mm -hmm. it too. And then they oh. have different interpretations of the Bible, um, they're, they're different denominations of Christianity. <laughs> then they have infighting and they disagree with each other about what the Bible says. It's just a mess. It doesn't help. I, I'm doing a video at the moment, and I haven't told him about this, but I'm doing a video at the moment on apologetics' biggest problem. And... Uh, it's going to be a banger. Like I'm really excited for this video to come out. I've been working on the script and, and spending a lot of time on it. But what I discovered is essentially that is like you, like why the message is so confusing. You can make, it's like, you can make something work. Like, let's say, I don't know, the genealogies, you can make it work, but then that causes all these other problems for the rest of, of scripture. Right. Like, yeah. uh, well, it was, a classic apolog apologetic trick is well it wasn't it was mary's bloodline because they didn't have a word for father-in-law okay we do now why did the bible translators choose not to translate it as father-in-law why did they choose to translate the word as father the bible you're you're telling you're saying the bible's wrong like the apologist is saying the bible's wrong like it's it's the wrong word it's actually it actually means stepfather or father-in-law or something 
what? Why? I thought this was supposed to be this, this like perfect document that teaches us how to live our lives. Like, why do we need like to pour over dusty manuscripts and like pour through libraries in a book to get God's basic message, you know? And uh, anyway, I won't give too much more away. Yeah. Because what they could have done is they could have easily have stated in Luke. Cause they'll, they'll say that Luke's genealogy is the one that goes back to Mary. Matthew's genealogy mm. is the one of Joseph. And yet both Matthew and Luke are very clear. Forget the whole father or mother stuff that you're getting into. Um, that's just nonsense because if they, if the author of Luke's gospel wanted to state, it was, it was Mary's genealogy. It would have said, these are the ancestors of Mary. Just mm. like Matthew's gospel makes it clear that those are the ancestors of Joseph. Yeah. The problem is, this is Luke's gospel also says those are the ancestors of Joseph, and it provides a contradictory name for Joseph's father. But, yeah. like, even go, go back a step further back, like a step further back from that. It's like, why does an all knowing, all powerful, loving God care at all about race or bloodlines? This seems eugenic y and like just dumb like this this seems so human why on earth does an all-powerful god need to have a perfect bloodline from david to, like that he's creating the rules here right like why this is so bizarre like it just it just reeks of human design but it just like <laughs> you know what i mean it's like think about this like forget about god of the old testament and think of like the creator of the universe he's like all powerful like he's just like the most perfect powerful creator and he's like but i want there to be a perfect bloodline like it's a why what 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 are you, Hitler? Like, this is so creepy and weird. Like, it's just, it's, it's so human. <laughs> it's like, you know what I mean? Like, and it's, yeah. well, I just, there's so many things in the, in the Bible that are like that. It's just like, well, this has to be the case because God wanted this. And it's like, why, why, why? Like, you know, slavery, God wanted, God was teaching people to live, how to live in a corrupt society. Don't eat shrimp. God was teaching people to, you know, to live in a good, don't pick up six on the Sabbath. It's like, what do you mean? Like, God's hands tied on certain things. Like he can say, don't eat shrimp, but he can't say, don't own another human being as property. Like, it's just, it's this bizarro world that apologists jump into that is just like, again, it's like a D and D campaign where you're like, okay, this is fun guys. But like, you know, like <laughs> come on, let's get real now. Like, let's, 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 let's be serious about this. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, what, one of the other things that really that's really annoying is is that it just shows how much of an uphill battle that they have trying trying to defend and justify their faith when they have to go so far as to do all the things that we just talked about and then they try to shoehorn christian ideas into the hebrew bible the old testament that's not yeah oh. <laughs> yes we all know about the whole business in isaiah about the virgin birth and because in the septuagint mistranslated the a particular word there was parthenos when it was in the hebrew is alma young woman not betula that's vir, that's virgin but but oh, yes yeah so Septu, the septuagint puts it parthenos a virgin and parthenos you you can hear athenos it's like a fina fina is a virgin goddess so you can hear that in there um yeah so matthew's quoting the septuagint and that's how matthew screws it up because the septuagint screws it up so it's matthew's citing the septuagint from uh, the, the isaiah and the septuagint so that's what happened mm -hmm. um and but that i'm just getting started there because in genesis 18 i think it's in genesis 18 yeah there are some that will try to say oh look you see right there it is right there abraham appears so God appears to Abraham, I meant to say. And Abraham looks up and it says, Behold, he saw free men standing over him. So some Christians are like, oh, wait a minute. You see, the book of Genesis knew about the Trinity. God is three different people <laughs> appearing to Abraham. I'm like, I haven't no, heard that. That's amazing. No, that's not even, <sighs> they won't even read the entire chapter, which explains that those free men are not supposed to be God. That's not the point. Um, it's just, it's, that's how desperate they are. Any any attempt to try to make it look like it fits their doctrinal view. They just say, there it yeah. is. I got it. Makes it, make it stick. 
You know? Yeah, it's like the it, they start they start with their belief and then find reasons to justify that belief. You, you know, when I start seeing Christians, and I got friends and family that are going through this at the moment, when I start seeing Christians change the denominations, like I no longer believe in tongues, or now I believe in predest, I go, ooh, I, I think they're on their way to becoming an atheist because, like, when you start to see problems and then try and find solutions like i just some a lot of the time i just see them like well this doesn't make sense this makes sense and then eventually they need like that usually someone needs that emotional catalyst like something the church hurts them or like something to to to, to warrant the energy it takes and it is hard to look into your beliefs and to examine them uh yeah it just but 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 once you if you do get that emotional catalyst i think I think that, yeah, that a lot of these friends and family and people I know might shift their beliefs entirely. And that's the other thing too, is, uh, I don't even ask, um, I don't even ask you what you believe. I imagine you're an atheist or. Yes. I'm an atheist. Yeah. Okay. Um, but like for me, I, I'm like, I've got no dog in this fight. Like I don't care if someone remains a Christian or like, I'm not like an, an atheist evangelist or anything. I really, like, I really don't care. I've done that deliberately because I never want to be, I, I, I want to remain open enough to be able to be reconvinced of a God. I don't want to like build myself as like the atheist guy or whatever. Right. Like I want, like I, it gets really important to me to try and be open minded as possible. So like, even when like my friends are in hospital, like I, I had um, some Christian friends recently in hospital who, were they're very strong christians and they their daughter was sick and i sent them a we sent them flowers on a card and and um i wrote a bible scripture in there that i know that will make them feel good <laughs> like i don't believe the bible scripture but i know they do and i know they know that i don't believe in god but they'll probably very they were very thankful that i sent that but it's like yeah it's it's this uh I, so it's like almost like i don't it's, it's you become untouchable because like i'm not I'm just I'm just telling you what I think. I'm not trying to convert anyone away from their religion. I'm not trying to, but but I'm not trying to convert anyone to a religion. I'm just explaining the issues that I have with some of these, uh, some of the reasoning around these religious beliefs. But you find that so many apologists, well, sorry, every single apologist comes across in some way, some are better than others, but they come across as like car salesmen. They're never, ever, ever going to convince you not to get a car. They're just that, you know, you'd be like, oh, do I really need a car? I can ride my push bike. No, no, no. You really need like this car. You don't like the Jeeps? So come over to the Ferraris. Like they'll find one way to get you in a vehicle, but they're never not going to get you in a vehicle. Uh, you know what I mean? It's so, like, yeah. And do you notice that like a lot of them at the moment, and I, I don't know if it's, if it's always been like this, but they seem to be like a bit panicky at the moment about like a lot of the because there's a lot of there's a lot of scholarship that's coming out oh, yeah. on youtube and they're getting like really like flustered they're oh, like no. they produce and like you got like who's that sentinel apolog of, of sentinel apologetics i don't mean to try and slander people on your show to get you clipped or whatever like get you clipped in the or maybe it's good for your channel but but like that sentinel apologetics dude just like calling people cucks like he's meant to be a christian he's calling like what is it mark uh dan and dan McClellan and Kip Cox because they like Francesca's work. What? Like, this makes no. If he, if Francesca, Dr. Francesca Stafford was a male, he wouldn't use the word cock. He's being like sexist. I'm like, this is so. Right. You're showing your power level. Like, you're, you're just, you're being like sexist and like, um, and just like chill out. Like, calm down like you know what i mean like if you if you really yeah. if you're if, if you're struggling that much because someone believes something differently than you or someone uh is not even it's not even a belief but if someone discovers something that contradicts your preconceived idea about god you don't have to get like all petty like that like that's like i don't know that's not the christianity that i grew up with i'll get petty every day like i you know what i mean but you're supposed to be the representative of christ you know what I mean? Like, right. you know what I mean? Like, what? It's just, it's just weird to me. It's really weird. Right. They're supposed to be, at least according to the teachings of the Christ that they believe in, uh, forgiving of others, get along with other people, um, and yet they act completely in the opposite way. Mm. So it, it's so, it's so uh, bizarre. 
Yeah, I got it. They get so flustered so easily. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I know. It's like I because when when I was a Christian, like I remember I I was lent a car I, 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 and it was like a sports car kind of you. I had to drop some friends at, a, at the pub and I wasn't going to the pub, obviously, because I was a Christian, but I was I was dropping them in to be a good brother. Uh, it wasn't my brother's car, but it was his friend. I was dropping them in and I drove the car and I ended up driving home and I, I went a little bit faster than the speed limit. I went like 10 kilometers over because I was like, yeah, this car's sick. And I got home and I repented. I got on my knees and repented about going 10 kilometers over in the car. If like, I, if I, you know, I, I sent some, even today I'm like that. I sent some, I don't repent, but I sent some, you know, really nasty tweets to um, uh, Axe 27 Apologetics. What's, what's his name? Um, Is that David uh, Wood? David Wood, yeah. yeah, yeah to Capturing yeah. Christianity um you know Cameron Bertuzzi captioned Christianity like not be, not not being critical of their ideas which I think is fine but being uh, pro uh protagonistic towards them as people and I felt I've, I realized I felt bad about that as, uh, after the the issues with I had on my channel with um with Godless Engineer who we've since you know I've since reached out and apologized to him as well but I reached out to these folks over email and was like because they blocked me <laughs> well Cameron hasn't, he probably muted me, but I reached out to them and I was like, Hey, just so you know, I'm sorry for my past actions. I'm sorry for doing these things. You know, it, it wasn't, um, helpful for the, the discourse. I don't have any feeling negative feelings against you personally. Um, I hear nothing back, which is fine, but it's like, why is the atheist dude being the one that's like bearing the hatchet and like, if I, if that happened to me as a Christian, I'd be so ashamed. I'd be like, man, I really need to get my life right with God. Like, so why is the atheist coming to me to apologize about how they've been acting, which is fair because we've both been acting crappy towards each other, but it's like, whoa, like, do you know what I mean? Like why, yeah. why is the atheist being the, the, the moral one here or the, the, the admitting where they're wrong, I guess, because I was wrong. I shouldn't have been protagonist. Uh, so aggressive. But yeah, I, I just you know I never hear back. But it's just I just don't understand how I think of those ver the verses. You know, um, many on those days will say to me, "Lord, Lord," and and I'll say to him, say to them, uh, "Turn away from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness." And that used to scare me so much. Like, whoa, you can be prophesying and casting out demons and. Oh, sorry, it just froze. Yeah, I think I yeah, I think you froze just for a moment. You were you were okay, at, cool. uh, casting oh, out pack. You casting out demons. <laughs> yeah, um sorry, my, my my one of my monitors like unplugged for a second. But yeah, like the the, the Bible scriptures you'll be casting out demons, you know, speaking other languages and all and, and you'll be praising God and heading towards Christ on that faithful day, and he'll say, Turn from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. And it's just like, so you have to follow what the Bible teaches as a Christian. And I just do not understand how a lot of these apologists have tricked themselves into believing that they can just be assholes in the name of Christ. Like, I just don't understand it. Frank Turek, another great example. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like Ken Tovin, like Ken Ham, you know. Um, well, Ken Ham's more of a liar. Um Kent Hovind's a liar and a and a um and a bit of a troll, but yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so we got a super chat from Moosings from an old man. See, thank you for your super chat. Good evening. If a man who no longer believes is an atheist, are other intelligent mammals such as dolphins, gorillas, elephants, or giraffes atheists? Is an aardvark an atheist? <laughs> Uh, I think that um, I personally think that I, I hold a position on atheism that is just without theism. So do those creatures have theism? I don't know. I don't know their internal psychology. Maybe they, maybe there is an aardvark heaven that they believe in. Probably not. I probably don't think they have the mental capacity to believe that, but, um, but yeah, I would say that, yeah, of course they're all atheists. Like it just, yeah, I just without theism, this is how I view it. It's not a, it's not a like, it's not a, it's not 
pair of it's not a set of clothes you put on it's i'm not going to wear these religious clothes anymore that's all it is it's not like putting on a new ring it's taking off the ring that you already had on i'm gonna take this question from winnie jones when he says do we have any evidence of the spiritual what are your thoughts on that it's actually, uh, it's a really interesting because I started with, I saw all those quote unquote spiritual things, right? And there was some pretty hectic stuff. Uh, so I, I, I need to, I go back to first principles and go, I need to understand what the person means by spiritual. But if we just accept what the general terminology is, I don't think there's any evidence for the um, spiritual or supernatural. Um, the spiritual in the sense of like, I look up at the stars and I feel like a tugging at my heart or something. Yeah. Like I definitely experienced that, but supernatural, not so much. Uh, there's a, there's someone that I'm in the process of, of, um, of interviewing on deep drinks. I might be making a little video with them that literally called out all the witches on TikTok, uh, witches and warlocks and everything. And he did exactly what they said. He sent them, his hair, he sent them, he sent them bodily fluids and he said, curse me. He goes, curse me. Like, so something bad will happen. And he waited over a year and like, they all got it. They all did their little videos. Like I'm cursing you now. And like, they're famous people and nothing happened to this band. So like, I don't know, like, I don't know how much more evidence you need. Um, and that like, but yeah. What about yourself, Jacob? What do you think? I, I really don't think there is evidence for the spiritual either. So I agree. I, I, I mm -hmm. think it's nonsense. <laughs> yeah. So my closing question, um, what would your advice be to um, people that are leaving the faith or, or well, let me put it another way, struggling. They don't know what to do. They're at a crossroads mm -hmm. kind of like you once were. So what would you say to those people? Well, first of all, I would uh, I would say that it's it is hard. Like it's definitely hard, re regardless of like what you decide to do with it. If you do decide to investigate your beliefs, regardless of whether or not you remain a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu at the end of it, and you discover evidence for that, or whether or not you discover that you did, don't have sufficient reason to believe in your God belief anymore, I applaud you, and I think it's an incredible incredibly hard and challenging thing to do. I, and I think it's uh, incredibly brave to do that. First of all, if you do discover that you know now no longer believe and uh, you are now struggling because a lot of your social groups, uh, families, friends, they do believe, just, and this is the hardest part is unfortunately some you've, you've, it's a very hard rope to walk if you you might go through an angry atheist stage where you want to tell everyone about how dumb religion is everyone kind of goes through that but remember that when your family and friends and uh loved ones are still in that old mindset or still in that mindset like everything that you do looks like um i guess an attack and can like hurt their feelings and things like that and logic doesn't matter so it <laughs> to, to, you know, in those situations. So my advice would be to ask permission to um, question anyone's deeply held beliefs. Say, can I, can I ask you a question about what you just told me? You've, um, I'm not, uh, use, the t use terminology that's very soft. Don't say, I don't believe, because for Christians, they'll usually think that belief is like an action. You are, you, it's a choice where it's not. So I changed my wording to be, I'm no longer convinced or maybe, or like, I, I, I'm struggling with this. I, I'd like to try and understand more. Use very, um, very soft language because it's very personal uh, for a lot of people. And then just take one day as it comes and just be honest to yourself and just, and just, if you get angry and have arguments with people, that's fine. Everyone does, but just try and remember that people, everyone is human. No one has all the answers. They may be right. Try and find, you know, if you're arguing with someone, they may be right. So try and get to the bottom of it so you can become religious again. Who knows? You know, I mean, don't don't go into it knowing that you don't have 
evidence for God, but just asking good questions, and eventually they'll stop asking you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for joining me uh, today, David McDonald. <laughs> thank you so much. And just to remind everybody, uh, the link to his channel we, is in the description below, and it will be in the pinned comment. So check it out and subscribe. Thanks again, awesome. Thank you, guys. Bye. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.